Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, including people with disabilities in nonprofits and foundations. For those of you who are returning candid webinar participants, a warm welcome back. And to those of you who are first, here for the first time, I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Next slide. My name is Elizabeth Zavada, and I am a program specialist for Candid based in New York, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Next slide. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we want to share with you that last year, Foundation Center and Candid and GuideStar joined forces to become a new single organization called Candid. Together, we have over 80 years of experience in the nonprofit sector. Next. Every year, millions of nonprofits spend trillions of dollars around the world. Candid finds out where that money comes from, where it goes, and why it matters. We also believe that an effective social sector is critical for a thriving society, and we believe in the importance of solutions for the sector, by the sector. With Candid, nonprofits, foundations, donors, and the public can all be on the same page. Through research, collaboration, and training, Candid connects people who want to change the world with the resources that they need to do it. Next. With Candid, you can find funding with Foundation Directory online and search 140,000 funders and 12 million grants. You can also increase your visibility with the funder community by creating and maintaining your GuideStar nonprofit profile. You can also continue to strengthen your nonprofit by participating in grants-based trainings to move your fundraising skills to the next level. Next. To learn more about our capacity building training programs, you can visit grantspace.org. We offer courses across the country at a location near you. I'd also like to go over a few items so you know how to take part in today's event. We've taken an example of the attendee interface. You should hopefully see something similar on your screen. If you need to adjust how you're listening into this webinar, please select the audio settings. There is also closed captions available for today's webinar. To turn them on, you can select the closed captions on the control panel. And we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. So to submit any questions that you might have, just select the Q&A tab to submit your questions through the panel. Next. Yes, we are recording today's webinar. So if there's anything that you'd like to review, you'll receive a link to view the recording along with a transcript and a PDF version of the slide deck in a follow-up email that will be sent to you within the next week. Next. I'd now like to introduce our guests from RespectAbility. Today we have Jennifer Laszlo Misrahi, Tatiana Lee, and Matan Cook. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Jennifer so she can introduce herself and her colleagues. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for having us today. And thank you to Candid for the remarkable and transparent and, and vivid and uh, really public serving um, work that you do and that your team does at Candid every single day. Um, as Elizabeth said, I'm Jennifer Laszlo Mizrahi. I am the president of RespectAbility, which is a nonprofit organization which fights stigmas and advances opportunities for people with disabilities. I myself am dyslexic and have other disabilities, and we are a disability-led organization. My colleagues Tatiana Lee and Matan Koch are each extraordinary leaders um, and champions of disability inclusion and access. They're going to give you some really concrete tips that will enable your nonprofit or fund foundation to really thrive in the future. Um, Tatiana is a Hollywood inclusionist. Matan Koch is an attorney. He went to Yale undergrad, Harvard Law, served in the Obama administration. Both of them are each wheelchair users um, as well, and they're just extraordinary um, leaders. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tatiana, who's really going to lead us through so much here. Thank you so much, Tatiana, for taking it to the next level. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that introduction, and welcome so much. Um, I'm going to start with the D in diversity. So a lot of times people have conversations about diversity and inclusion, and you guys forget about the D. And we always say that the D in diversity is disability. And organizations are at their best when they welcome, respect, and include people with disabilities. And just, I'm gonna share a little bit more about that with you in a little bit. So next slide, please. 
Now, these are people with disabilities. We have Stephen Hawkins, Whippy Goldberg, um, Greta, Thurn uh, Greta Thurnberg, and with um, so many more. These are all people with disabilities who you may or may not know of, but more than likely you know them. They are celebrities. They are people that have made change in our society. And all, all of them credit their disabilities as a strength and a superpower that they have that really helps them solve issues and make them stronger than right. if they didn't have a disability. Next slide, please. Right. 61 million people in the US have a disability and that's one in four adults. And the reason we say adults is because as you age and get older, um, you may acquire a disability. And under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, a disability is sensory, physical, um, mental and so many more. So those are things that are considered a disability. That would be dyslexia, being a wheelchair user, um, so many more. And then as far as disability, it's temporary or permanent. So you can break your leg and be in a cast for a little bit, or it can be permanent where you have an accident and now you're a wheelchair user or an amputee. It can be visible and non-visible, which very visible. I'm a wheelchair user, so my disability is very visible or non-visible like ADHD or dyslexia or um, depression and so on and so forth. Right. And then, or it can be acquired or at birth. So my myself and my colleague Matan, ours were acquired at birth where someone can have an accident and um, have some type of illness and have it acquired later in life. Next slide, please. Now, it's very important to understand that disability intersects into every other marginalized group. So African-Americans with disabilities, I myself am an African-American woman with a disability. Um, the Latinx community, women with disabilities, even the LGBTQ community. Disability is the only marginalized group that does not discriminate and intersects into all other marginalized communities. And that's something to think about because a lot of people don't think that disability affects everyone. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Like I said, anyone can join the disability community at any point. Um, you can go outside and have a simple fall or, you know, get hit by somebody's bike or something and, and have an accident or due to illness that you've acquired at a later age. And we are cutting edge and innovative. And I say that because we live in a world that isn't adapted to us. So every day we have to think outside the box to accomplish the things that we want to accomplish and get done. And we are diverse and, like I said, a part of every other community. Next slide, please. There are 7 million students with disabilities in public school today. And 52% of those students are, are people with disabilities who are also people of color. And only 65% of those people with disabilities finish high school. Um, that is a very, very alarming statistic. And we're going to help you with tips so that you can really be equipped to help people with disabilities succeed um, and how you can enable them to be able to be a part of your organization and the work that you are doing to help them strive so we can get those numbers up. Next slide, please. Now, only one in three people with disabilities have a job. That means 70% of people with disabilities want to work but may not be able to or may not have a job. Um, so these are some very, very alarming stats. So just think about it. There's 70% of people with disabilities that want to work, but don't have access to work. <clears throat> and so there's over 8 million people with disabilities ready to strengthen your organization. And I say that because like I said, we're innovative, we think out of the box. And so we may be able to problem solve in ways that someone who does not have a disability may not think about or understand. And so we help to broaden your organization and have you think outside of the box ways. Next slide. And so this is a annual disability statistics compendium. It is a study that is put out every year on stats on employment for people with disabilities. Um, later on when we send this, you will be able to click and find your state and find out disability employment in your specific state. 
Now, this slide um, is an example of just people with disabilities were able to problem solve. Just in general, we could be in a location where there's a stair and we may not be able to participate in, in having access to that. So we are great at problem solving to say, hey, let's maneuver this and move it around and hey, I can be included. And so that is just an example of a way that we think out of side of the box that you may not have thought of to make sure that we are included and can participate, which makes us great employees. Thank you, Tatiana. I think that um, what you're pointing out is so very important. And, and really, this is about equity. This is about dignity. And this is about the kind of values that everyone on this webinar really agrees with. So for example, decades ago, we had a very overt racism, so much so that we had segregated bathrooms, segregated schools, segregated restaurants and everything. And I think pretty much, I hope that everyone on this webinar would agree that we would never support um, any kind of nonprofit organization that was segregated um, based on race that would exclude people of color, that this is against our values and therefore we ensure that our practices uh, do not promote um, racism of any kind. Likewise, if this was the board of directors of a nonprofit organization serving inner city youth, um, would you want to support them? Of course, we're seeing now um, a slide that pictures an, a room of all white men. So imagine if they're supposed to be serving girls of color, for example, nobody that represents the community they're trying to serve is on that board. So you wouldn't do that today. Hopefully, every organization is putting measures in place to ensure that that kind of discrimination and that lack of access is not, is not happening. But at the same time, I'd like you to take a look at this slide. In this slide, you see a picture of Tatiana. This is my colleague who you just heard from a few moments ago, and you can see her through the video. Tatiana is looking at a, uh, at a set of stairs that she obviously can't get up. And it happens far too often that Tatiana and my colleague Matan, who's also a wheelchair user, literally cannot get into nonprofit organizations um, to do the kind of activity that they would like to do um, to benefit other people. So this is really important. And, and it's important not just for people with disabilities, it's important also for people without disabilities. This is a major, major study done by the company Accenture. And what it shows is that when people with disabilities are included in broader organizations, and in this, in this case, is for-profit companies, that it's more productive in these organizations, that staff turnover declines, that morale goes up, that there's more innovation. So having an inclusion, an intentional inclusion policy and practice is good for both people with disabilities and people um, without disabilities. And in fact, that goes across the board, not just to you know, employers and nonprofits, but it's also true of candidates. I mean, one of the main problems in elections today is that the campaigns are not accessible. They have websites that people can't access if they're blind. They have videos with no captions. People who are deaf can't have access to them. This is really against uh, the democratic principles of everybody being able to participate in our democracy. So how do we know this? Um, you know, there's anecdotal evidence and then there's really large studies. We did a really Really large study on disability in philanthropy and nonprofits. Um, this is a study that we did five focus groups in partnership with the Council on Foundations. We then did 14 one-on-one -on -one interviews. Then we followed up with um, evaluating 25 of the largest foundations, 25 of the largest nonprofits. And we did a survey of almost a thousand people that was done in partnership with Nonprofit Times, Chronicle of Philanthropy, and other philanthropy-serving organizations. So, so what did we find? And I hope that everyone on this webinar really appreciates this data because it's so important to see that over, um, that, that you have about 40% of the events that are being put on by organizations are being put on in spaces that my colleagues Matan and Tatiana literally can't get into, or if they can't get can get in the door, they certainly can't use the bathroom because the 
facilities are not um, physically accessible. Um, this is very easily resolved because there are so many accessible locations that you can choose, but it's about making it a part of your protocol. The second piece that we see is that there needs to be a process where employees, trustees, board members, and volunteers with disabilities can request and get accommodations if needed so they can succeed in their roles. We see again, the majority of nonprofits are not doing this. Um, you know, enabling people who come to a public event to request an accommodation such as sign languages, live captioning, or if they have a simple food allergy, just putting it in the registration form, we see that only 30% of nonprofits are doing that, which means that 70% are not. Um, you know, for people who are blind or who have low vision, when they come to a picture on the internet, if you save that picture um, with a label, like a label that says picture of dog or a label that says, you know, link to application form. Um, that tells the person who is blind what they're looking at, quote unquote. They may not be able to see, but actually every single computer and phone now sold, you know, to every single person has um, accessibility features that will get that phone or that computer to talk to them and read out the information. But you have to put that information in or they won't know what it is. So for people who have an application to apply to um, for a job or to apply for funding or to attend an event, you need to label these things very clearly so that people with low vision who are blind can participate. And we see that only 17% of nonprofits are doing it. Yeah. Likewise, um, you know, videos are very important and over 38 million people in America are either deaf or hard of hearing. So they can only participate in videos if there's captions. One of the beautiful things today is that YouTube has an algorithm that if you take your, cat, your video from your nonprofit, create your own YouTube channel, very easy to do, and just put your videos on it instantly, automatically, and for free, there will be captions. Granted, my last name is Laszlo Mizrahi, so they're going to totally misspell my last name. So you have to go in and fix the spelling on some of the words, but instant and free. And yet only 14% of nonprofits are doing it. So this is very, very low hanging fruit that can be solved. And indeed, if we look at these different nonprofit organizations, again, this is a sample size of over almost a thousand people working in the nonprofit social sector. We see that very few nonprofit organizations have staff members, volunteers, and board members who have disabilities. This is particularly particularly striking when you think about the fact that one out of every four adults has a physical um, cognitive, mental health, or other disability. So, you know, if you've got an organization with 10 people on staff, you know, two or three of those folks should be people with disabilities. But look how many of the organizations have no people with disabilities as staff, board, or volunteers. It's a massive, massive problem. It's very much like that boardroom picture I showed you where every single person around the table is a white male, and yet they're serving um, a more diverse population without the expertise that is needed, um, the lived experience to do so in a good way. And in fact, one way to really sort of keep a handle on this is to ask your members or grantees if they are representative of the people you serve. And one of the beautiful things about um, GuideStar and Candid, if you want a platinum level, and our nonprofit is platinum member on Candid, which we consider very, very important uh, to really have the highest level on GuideStar, it does ask you if you're representative of the people that you serve, are you serving people of color, are you serving women, et cetera, who's involved? Now, one of the questions that Candid is now asking in that platinum status is, is disability, um, do you have people with disabilities on your team? So be sure that you're including people and that you're also measuring that, particularly as you're going for that platinum status. And it doesn't happen by accident. You, you have to be very intentional like any other diversity work to make sure that you're successful. Most organizations are not. And you can see that many organizations in this data are not including people with disabilities in their pictures. You see, today in 2020, uh, the, the um, website of an organization is like its lobby. And if the website has pictures of all the people that it's serving and the people who are on their staff and there's not a single person with a disability on that picture, hmm, 
Remember that picture I showed you early of the all white men sitting around the table? If you're Tatiana or Matan and you're a wheelchair user and you look at a website and there's not a single picture with a wheelchair user anywhere on the website or anyone with any kind of dis disability, what is that um, website telling you about that organization and whether they're going to be welcome or not? Is there, are there words on the website that say that the space is physically accessible and that they can get in? So I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Matan Koch, who's going to walk through some of the steps on how you can do this and how you as a nonprofit organization or a funder can be successful because you want to have the Greta Thunbergs of the world who are leading climate change or any other issue, you're going to want them on your team. So how do you do that? Turning it over to Matan. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and so the way you do it broadly is adding that disability lens to your work and you add that lens by thinking about the intersecting of all, but now we're gonna jump into some really concrete steps to do it if we can advance to the next slide. So the first is on the one hand, really straightforward, but so important, it's a public commitment, right? None of this happens unless leadership, unless the board, unless everyone says, we're going to do it. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens with intentionality and it happens when we repeat that message over and over again publicly. Next slide, please. Uh, but, you know, and why do we need that message? It's because people with disabilities are part of who we serve. And we know that organizations are at their best when those that we serve are a part of all of the decisions that we make. But when people with disabilities aren't at that table, they're on the menu, which is to say that essentially they are being sacrificed to offer it up and not appropriately included in your work. And this matters regardless of what your work is. If, if you work in race issues, gender issues, if you work in English language learner issues or education issues or criminal justice or reintegration issues or poverty issues, all of those, my friends, are disability issues because people with disabilities represent all of those things. And yes, if people with disabilities aren't a part of your organization, then all of the people with disabilities intersecting there are being left behind. Next slide, please. So the first step is to foster an inclusive environment, right? You can't have a place where people with disabilities are gonna come in unless they feel like it's a place that they can actually be. And there are simple ways to do this, using person-first language, or more importantly, using the language that a person expresses of how they like for their disability to be referred, sort of being up on that, and we have a resource for you about how to do that. Have an accommodate, which is linked there on the slide. Have an accommodation policy, right? If someone comes in and they need something, they need know how to ask it. And then you gotta make a, a, pro, a conscious effort to seek out those groups that you wanna have a part of. If they don't already know that they're welcome at their organization, especially if they haven't historically been welcome or your organization hasn't prepared them, they need to know that this is a place that wants them now. And the only way to do that is a little bit of outreach. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, do little things and big things. An example is say someone who uses a wheelchair rides or rides a wheelchair. Don't say wheelchair bound can find a wheelchair or my personal favorite wheelchair person. Uh, first of all, I'm not confined to my wheelchair. It's what allows me to move around. And I certainly don't know what a wheelchair person is now, uh, except perhaps some interesting hybrid between Matan and machine. But, but I think the key is You'll know some of this from the lexicon link we showed you. And if you don't know, just ask. People are happy to answer and they're glad that you wanted to know. And then you wanna work with people with disabilities. That means you wanna bring us in. That there is a picture of my California team. You'll notice that we are all people with disabilities. That isn't always the way we do it, but we do like to have uh, large numbers of folks with disabilities. And you're gonna want to know how to do that. And so. Here at Respectability, we're going to show you some best practices. Capability can help you source talent. Ask Jan can help you, which is a, a website promoted by the government. It's the Job Accommodation Network, can help you to figure that out. And if you want more 
information, we have a whole webinar that will tell you how to recruit, accommodate, and promote people with disabilities that you can watch at your leisure. Next slide, please. Um, this may seem like a death statement, but have an inclusion point person or committee. You know that old story about uh, if everybody thinks someone else is going to do something, then nobody actually does it? Well, never is that more true than in the case of inclusion. There just needs to be someone or a group of people whose job it is to get this done, or it's the kind of thing that is going to be forgotten. And we have some resources here if you want to figure out how to do that. You'll be getting access to this presentation afterwards. Uh, next slide, please. You know, and then as Jennifer said, include people with disabilities in your marketing. How do we get out the message that we do actually want people with disabilities and we do serve people with disabilities? Well, people with disabilities need to see themselves when you communicate. People with disabilities need the message. Questions about how to do that? We have a toolkit for media representation and another one in our webinar series that will walk you through this in step-by-step. Step. This is actually a two-parter um, and you'll get to see more of my colleague Tatiana Lee if you click on it uh, and it'll be great stuff for you. Uh, next slide, please. Make sure that your websites and online resources are available. As Jennifer mentioned, in today's world, your website is your waiting room. But even more than that, in today's world, you know, a huge percentage of people may never physically walk through your door or call your organization. They interact with you via your web presence. And you invest in your web presence. You care about your web presence. But make sure that your web presence is accessible. Make sure it has that alt text that Jennifer was talking about for screeners. Make sure your videos are captioned. There are other steps, and again, you can find it right in our webinars. Uh, next slide, please. Also, make sure that your physical office and your physical events are accessible. It's funny, physical access is, in one level, usually the first thing that people think about, but on the other level, it sometimes gets totally missed in this day and age, because 30 years after the ADA, there's a lot more physical access than there was when I was a child, say, in the pre-ADA world. But it means that we actually have to be more thoughtful and making sure that it's been done and it's been done well. And then here's the thing. If you change it, if you become more accessible, you got to let people know about it. So this picture you'll actually see is a building under construction. And this building is really interesting. It was not physically accessible to people with mobility impairments and other needs. And they made a strong organizational commitment that they wanted to change that. You can see it's under relation, but most importantly, once they did that, you see they put up a big sign that says, this is what we're doing. Now, why did they do that? It wasn't self-congratulation. It's because if I have known for years that I can't get through the door of your organization and then you change it, I need to know that or I've written off the notion that I can come. So find ways to communicate the good work that you do when you decide to take these steps in all of your communications though. Uh, next slide, please. Now we are offering some resources. There's a wonderful resource guide put together by the Chicago Community Trust. Again, the link here in our presentation. Uh, next slide, please. And other resources will be, but then what else can you do? Okay, so you're a small nonprofit. You have a few folks working for you and you hire people maybe once every couple of years. It's not going to be immediate that you can bring on a staff member for with this way, but I bet you all use vendors. You all use other people to do the things that you don't do yourself. Well, when you're looking for vendors, why don't you look for vendors that either hire people with disabilities or even more exciting are owned by people with disabilities. The federal government maintains a listing of disability owned businesses, patronize some of them. It's another way to bring people in and we have a resource here for you on that but but really something to think about and then if you are either a um, a grant making organization or an organization that supports or interacts with membership ask about it right you know a lot of people on this webinar today I bet you never thought about this stuff until we told you about it and so I bet the people that you work with never thought about it yet either. And you can be the ambassador. You can sort of say, hey, what about this? And for those of you that are in a grant making or other sort of philanthropy serving role, 
you know, Jennifer likes to say, and so I'm quoting her, even though she's right here on the phone, that they who have the gold make the rules. It's her version of the golden rule. Hold your grantees accountable. You know, this is easy stuff to do. It's cheap stuff to do, and you actually have the leverage to make sure that people do it. So why not? It's, uh, it's such a wonderful way to move this along. Next slide, please. And, you know, there are real examples of this. The Ford Foundation is like a tremendous success story. And why are they a tremendous success story? Because a few years ago, they weren't doing this at all, right? The disability wasn't on their radar screen. And, and respectability, really, Jennifer approached Darren Walker. And Darren, made a, he's the leader of the Ford Foundation. He made a very strong commitment to this. He's written about it. We've shared the links. And now Ford includes the facet of disability in everything that they do. It's a 360 turnaround in a very short period of time, and they're really a great example of just how to do this well and how you can get from where you are today to where you want to be in a very short time. Uh, next slide, please. So what's today's big takeaway, the big message? Well, organizations are at their best when they welcome, respect, and include people of all backgrounds. This includes people with disabilities. Don't take our word for it. We have data. We've shared some of it. We have more if you'd like to see it. Uh, and also, problems are best solved by working with people who've experienced them firsthand and know the solutions that work. Again, remember Jennifer's picture. We wouldn't want a bunch of white men trying to solve the issues for you know women of color. We don't want a bunch of all able-bodied folks trying to figure out what the solutions are for those of us with disabilities. Let us work together uh, with our lived experience. Uh, next slide. And so we, I've made mention as I've been talking of our webinar series, we actually had like this entire fantastic webinar series. Hundreds of people attended live just as you're doing now. But then we said, hey, this is a resource to the nonprofit world. So we've made it all available on our website with the PowerPoints, with captioned video, with transcripts, so that at any time, day or night, in perpetuity, you can go to our website. And here's a listing of all of the topics that we offered and a link to do so. And guess what? Before long, this webinar, I think, will be right up there with them. So yet another resource for you. And you can always look at our other things. We have an inclusive philanthropy toolkit. We have um, we have lots of resources, um, and we want for you to do it. We have a Twitter feed, we have a Facebook feed, and our website, and you can always reach out to us. Next slide, please. Now we'd be really pleased to answer the questions, both the ones that you put in the Q&A box and the ones that uh, you want to ask us now as, uh, as we open it up, so please. Questions for any or all of us would be really welcome. Okay, so we have um, three or four questions so far, so I'm just gonna read them. It says, one says from Alyssa, I am part of the leadership of an organization focused on and largely run by people with particular disabilities, which I also have. Much of our work is done by volunteers and many of our volunteers are disabled, but we have high rates, high rates of turnover what advice do you have for recruiting and engaging disabled volunteers better? So Matan, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Why don't you start and I'll jump in. So first of all, let me give you a little bit of an overview on disability. So, um, you know, if you think about civil rights in America, um, we're more than 100 years past when women got the right to vote. Um, we're more than 50 years past uh, the March on Washington, when uh, you know Martin Luther King gave his very amazing speech. We are 50 years plus past Stone, um, Stonewall, where we saw the LGBTQ community um, get some important rights. But in terms of the disability community, um, our major legislation didn't happen until 30 years ago. So, so by the way, I think all marginalized communities still have a long way to go. The battle for equity is, uh, is a big one and we all have a long way to go, but we're at least 20 years behind. 
And so for a lot of disabilities also, particularly ones that are non-visible like mental health or learning disabilities, people are very much in the closet the way the LGBTQ community was 20 years ago because there's so much stigma around them. So there are a couple things that, that, that happened. One is that the stigmas were very great and the expectations for people with disabilities to have a better future, to get education and jobs were very, very poor. And so what happened is that parents, largely parents with relative privilege, started different disability organizations. So most of these organizations were single disability, blindness or autism, or they were a wheelchair user, but it was just one disability like the group that you're talking about, not multiple disabilities, number one. Number two, they were almost all started by white parents from two-parent families. Um, even though today the majority of school children with disabilities, and there are six million school children with disabilities in America today, the majority of them are children of color, but the majority of disability leaders in our country are white and from two parent families. So it's very important to focus on diversity writ large and equity writ large so that more people of color, whether they're black or brown or Asian, that there's much more diversity in the disability movement. I would work very hard to make sure that you represent every kind of diversity. And I will also say that it's very important that people with disabilities themselves are playing leading roles here, making sure that they're getting promoted, that they're getting to make decisions. So um, one of the things I always feel that when you have an issue of turnover, it's a question of did you give people tasks that were in smaller chunks so that they could have wins on a regular basis so that it's not, we're gonna change the whole world and if you don't change the whole world today, all is lost. Instead, it's let's try and get this mailing out to 200 people today, or let's try and send emails to 200 people. <coughs> let's find those 200 emails and get those done. By enabling people to have these smaller victories and they can build towards them, they build more confidence and they really feel that they're making a difference. And you have to thank people and let them see how the different pieces of that puzzle are connecting because if you ask somebody to send 200 emails and they don't understand the purpose of those emails is to connect to your elected officials about key legislation that impacts whether or not they're going to have a home for example whether or not they're going to have access to health care for example people have to understand what is at stake you know one of the big leaders of the disability rights movement was a guy named justin dart a great american hero we used to talk about how you have to act as if your life depends on your activism because indeed your life depends on your activism. So that's my first part of the question answer. Um, Matan, did you want to add more? Should we go to the And I think question? what I jump into the specific question of turnover when you're a disability run organization with mostly folks with, with the same uh, disability is that, is that I would you know, keep in mind the notion and this is funny, I mentioned that our California staff is all wheelchair users, but sometimes when everyone has like the same set of challenges, it actually is sort of important to make sure that you have one or two people in the mix that maybe have a different set of experiences just so that everyone is not, you know, everyone's pain point is not the same pain point. Because you know, one of the things I do when I talk about the abilities of people with disabilities is I say that everyone, whether a disability or not, has different strengths and different challenges. And if you need too much of grouping everyone with all the same challenge, then you have a small deficit in maybe in a particular strength area that can make it a harder, a harder work experience. So I don't, you know, this is better perhaps for an offline conversation where you can share more about this specific issue and maybe we can dive into it a little bit. But, but it seems to me that that is another thing to be aware of in that context. Before we jump to the next question, Tatiana, I just want to make sure that you See that we're also getting questions into the chat box, but I want to remind everyone that there's a separate Q&A box that you can pop your questions right into uh, that will yes. pop up in front of us. Please, it would be better, uh, but I will go to those. We have tons and tons of questions, so I love it. So someone said, in terms of disability, shifting to an alternative term, something like differently abled from someone with a disability perspective, is this important to you? I will answer the, um, this. Okay. I will take this, and then you can jump in. 
So I like to use the term disability. We are reclaiming it. I think society thinks disability as something negative. To me, I think it is something powerful and I'm happy to claim. Um, not only that, there are people that for years have fought for disability rights um, to have the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, which this is the 20th anniversary of, or 30th, 30th anniversary, right? Yeah, yeah, 30th anniversary of the ADA. And it's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so um, if you think about it, under civil rights, people with disabilities were not included in that. So the Americans with Disabilities Act is our Civil Rights Act. It basically says that I have a right to access to anything else. And so it's not the Americans with Differently Abled Act, it's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so because of that, in honor of the people that fought for me to have access to be able to get an education, have a job, be able to go grocery shopping and just be out in public, um, I wanna honor that. And that's just my personal response. Some people do say differently abled and that is okay. People self-identify in any way that they like, and that is up to them. You can't tell them anything wrong. But me personally, I like the word disability. And then I think that goes to another question that someone asked, and it was basically around the same thing of using different terms and identifying. And at the end of the day, give that person the autonomy to, to let you know what they want to identify as, just as much as you would ask someone their pronoun, he, she, they, the same thing. How would that person like to be identified? And when you just ask, and when all fail, call them by their name. And I think the only thing that I would add to that, everything Tatiana said is spot on, but so a lot of the terms like differently able, special needs, uh, what have you, come from a discomfort with the word disability that is not a discomfort that we people with disabilities have. It's a discomfort that folks without disabilities have. And I would also ask the question is, in each one of them sends a message. Differently able, well, the first question is, different from what? Different from you? Different. We're all differently abled. You have different abilities than I do. Jennifer has different abilities than Tatiana does. Special needs, well, why are my needs special? And so it's sort of one of these things where the great thing about the word disability is that it's been sort of universally agreed on as not being indicative of these discomforts and sort of preconceived biases. So we stick with it also as a matter of convenience. Again, with the important caveat that Tatiana offered of if a person specifically says that they prefer to be referred to in a particular way, then honor that. I have one or two colleagues that really do love the term special needs, and as much as I am not a fan of that term, I will always use it to refer to them, right? Because that's just showing them appropriate respect. Um, we have so. next. We, go oh. ahead, Tatiana. No, go ahead. What were you going to say? Go ahead. I'm I was going to go say, we have so many questions, we're going to need to move a little faster in our answers. Yeah. Yeah. When stigma exists around a certain disability, non-visible, how do organizations encourage people to self-report for accurate reporting? This is a good one. I, do one of you guys want to take this? Um, should I jump this? Go for one? it. Go for I, it. I believe that there's sort of two steps. The first is that you have to understand that an organization can't erase stigma just by promoting a message that says, don't be afraid to say this, right? Like you actually need to inculcate the idea slowly that it's okay at your organization and like respectability work in the larger world. The second thing that you sort of should do is make it almost a cost benefit analysis for the person. If there are a few people uh, who are comfortable sharing their disability and then comfortable sharing how strongly the organization wants to work to help them to succeed, that lowers a lot of that feeling of ooh, I'd best not disclose this because of the consequences for me. But ultimately, uh, lowering that stigma is a society-wide question and a huge part of our mission here at Respectability. I'm just gonna add uh, on to what Matan said, that mental health is the most common uh, disability for adults today. Um, and that a lot of people don't wanna acknowledge that they're living with a mental health condition. So um, a lot of organizations will bring in guest speakers to talk about mindfulness, to talk about 
wellness, to talk about work-life balance, to talk about stress management. They don't call it anxiety and depression session. Come and you know self-declare that you're living with anxiety and depression. Frequently, they like to just go to programs that are labeled differently. They might call it a wellness or a mindfulness program um, so that they can learn in that way. Um, and that that can be very helpful. And I do see that there's a very important question that I want to address that many nonprofit job descriptions require a valid driver's license, but the job functions don't actually mention driving. I have a disability that prevents me from driving. How do you handle this? I think it's really, really important to recognize that there's a lot of discrimination in the employment process. There's a lot of jobs that say, that you're required to have a driver's license. There are a lot of jobs that say you must be able to carry you know, 20 pounds and the job doesn't involve carrying anything. And so my, my, my advice is just to go ahead and apply and show them how great you are. And then when you're in the conversation, you can talk to them about um, the fact that, uh, you know, really it is, an, it's a discrimination issue. If the job doesn't require driving, um, they should not be asking for a driver's license. Do you want to add on to that as our in-house lawyer, uh, Matan? Yeah, so I think that let's step back to sort of the big picture. In general, uh, the ADA requ considers it discrimination if there is anything that is not ensuring people's success that is not what the law calls an essential function of the job. That a person with a disability is, in order to be protected in their application for a job, needs to be able to perform the essential functions with or without reasonable accommodation. What that means is that if something is in a job description and it's inessential, either because, as Jennifer pointed out, you don't do it at all, or simply because, honestly, it could be done by anyone and it, it just happens to fall in the job description, then denying someone a job on the basis of their inability to do that isn't just bad inclusion practice, it's illegal. Now, I will point out that nothing that we say in this webinar should be construed as legal advice and that you should consult your own counsel for all individual legal decisions, but it is good to really think about that when you're designing job descriptions. So I see a vast majority of people are asking questions about recruiting people with disabilities and any tips or suggestions besides what we said to, I guess, find people with disabilities. So I didn't know if any of you guys wanted to take that. So I have a few and I'm sure Jennifer has a few, but can I, should I jump in first? Please do. Um, one is, you know, make a relationship with the vocational rehabilitation and organization in your state. In all 50 states, there is a state agency that receives funding by the federal government and their job, their entire job, is to find people with disabilities and help them to find jobs. And you should have a relationship with those folks and they should know that you're open so that when they are looking to place someone, when they're looking to find the professional opportunity, they should know it. Number two, in your job descriptions, make it known, make it plain, not just, you know, find a way to indicate that you you know, work strongly on reasonable accommodation. Find a way to indicate that your disability, Emily, because I guarantee you there are people with disabilities looking for jobs right now who just don't know that your organization is a great place to work. And then look for good, strong partner organizations. In almost every community, there are great nonprofits helping people to find work. And I think Jennifer can speak more to some of those and where they are in different places. So Jennifer, uh, well, every, you want to jump uh, off every there. college campus has a disability services office and they have a career placement office. So um, I know, for example, that our organization, Respectability, that we have a training program specifically for young leaders who want to go in to working for nonprofit organizations. So if you have a job opening for a fairly um, entry level staff position, you can contact us because it may be that one of our alumni of our program may be exactly what you're looking for. So you can contact Respectability. 
but go to the um, colleges near you and go see their disability services coordinator and see if they have some great um, some great applicants along with their career services agencies. And there are certain kinds of jobs for which people with disabilities might be better. Um, so for example, Microsoft, JP Morgan Chase, and others who deal with either computer science or finance, spreadsheets, those sorts of things, they intentionally are trying to recruit people with autism because there's a fair amount of evidence that people with certain kinds of height autism have higher functioning skills when it comes to computer science, engineering, or finance. That's not true of all people with autism, but by having these intentional hiring programs, um, which by the way, don't, uh, don't require a job interview because people with autism, they might be amazing at computer spreadsheets, at um, databases, software engineering, but they might not be able to ha handle an interview where you ask them, you know, how is the weather today? And what's your favorite book? Um, so instead they've set up interviews where people are able to actually demonstrate their skills as opposed to make small talk. And then they're able to find exactly, um, exactly the right match. So hopefully that'll help you in your recruit. But again, um, you know, you are putting out job descriptions that probably have an EOC statement at the bottom. Have you taken a look recently at your website to see does your statement say that you welcome people of all races, sexual orientation and identities and immigrants? And are you missing the word disability in that statement? We have found that many organizations are missing the word disability in their equal opportunity statement on their website. Um, they're not offering um, a place where people can ask for an accommodation for their event. So if you want people with disabilities to join your board, there's a lot of questions about how do you get people with disabilities to join your board? Well, if you want people with disabilities to join your board and you want people who are deaf, for example, then you have to be willing to offer sign language interpreters for, um, for your board member or to use um, some of the technology that just does word to text. Um, so, so putting those accommodations in place and then really advertising them um, will really help you market your organization as a place that people will want to be a part of. So someone asked about, um, yes, links will be provided um, with this um, webinar so that you'll be able to click on. And so that will be available to you coming in the next week. And someone said about trainings to help leaders be comfortable with disability. So we have some webinars that you guys can check out that it can get you more information about different things like that. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add to that. I'll just say that on our website, the inclusive philanthropy section, there's some videos about disability etiquette, for example. There's a FAQ, frequently asked questions with a lot of Q and A's. There's a lot of links to other places. So just take a deep dive onto the respectability website. Um, you'll find uh, that there's um, really a lot um, that you can um, that you can really find and get. And I see that somebody um, is asking about, do you see a time in the near future we, where you don't have to lead your recommendations with use for person first language, even when appropriate? This feels so out of step with the larger disability movement in the US. Um, you know, they feel somebody is, you know, feeling deflated about the kinds of lexicon. I, I believe in something called ATP. ATP is ask the person, you know, ask people how they want to be referred. Most people want to be referred by their name. They don't want to be referred by their disability. I am dyslexic and I have ADHD, but I hope you won't call me that dyslexic person, Jennifer, just call me Jennifer. You don't have to label me. You can just call me by my name. And I think that that is really the best way. But again, it's and ask the person how they, how they want to be addressed. Can... Yeah, go ahead. If I can add the one thing, like, so there's this attention right now, we won't discuss it at length of, on the one hand, obviously we want to be individualized. On the other hand, a large part of language is signaling. So the reason that we still call out person first language is when you're not dealing with an individual, but you want to show that you're thinking thoughtfully about the issues, at least the use of person first language shows that your organization is thinking about. And I think to answer the question directly of when will stuff 
leading with it in our presentation, it's when there's a different uh, consensus of what, how one would signal that uh, as an organization. Uh, until then, we sort of give people the best tools that we've got. So that, that's where we're at at that moment. And, um, and these links are all on our PowerPoint, and the PowerPoint will be up within an hour. It'll take longer for the transcript to be up and for the video to be up because we will check it to make sure that it's exactly perfect before we um, post that. Um, but the PowerPoint itself that has links to all these different webinars and all these different fact sheets. One of my favorite ones is askjan.org. That's the federal government free resource on particularly the, around the laws and how to accommodate people with different specific disabilities. And they also have the ability for you to ask them specific questions and for them to give you free advice. Um, and I think they're just a fabulous um, organization. Again, that's ask, uh, askjan.org. Someone said they work at a large university and they hear that hiring folks with disabilities is loss of productivity due to absences, et cetera. Do you have a good argument? And I would say that earlier, that study that Jennifer mentioned, Accenture, to show that there is a 40% larger profit margin to um, when people welcome and include people with disabilities, that is a great argument. So to show that organizations are doing 40% better than organizations that don't, I think that is a really great argument and one that we use quite often. Do you have anything to add to and that? And I think the thing to remember is whenever someone offers you the notion that they lose productivity and money, you can at least be secure as you are going to, you know that that's not true. That is simple prejudice and bias, right? The studies simply show the opposite and you can point them to the studies, but you can be absolutely comfortable in that you don't have to refute an argument with anything other than, well, the truth is X, right? It's, it's not a philosophical uh, argument, if that makes sense. I think that also it's a matter of the sophistication of the organization. So here at an organization, respectability, the majority of our staff, the majority of our board are people with disabilities. I will also say that a third of our team are also people of color. We have a very large population from the LGBTQ community and that with disability, there does come in some instances medical issues. So how do we usually solve that? We let people work from home. We respect flex time. Um, but we find in our organization that our employees are all working more than 40 hours a week because they're very devoted to what it is that we do. And if on a given day they have a doctor's appointment that lasts for two hours, they're working more at some other time. They're picking up the slack on the weekend. That the people are very, very loyal. So there's the Accenture study that we mentioned. There's also a study that was done by Walgreens, which is a very large scale um, employer of people with disabilities. There's a new study that's gonna come out soon in the Harvard a business review that I'm looking forward to seeing. There's quite a number of studies that have shown that the productivity goes up for the entire organization. Now, that is because also, let's just be honest, that organizations that are inclusive of people with disability tend to be organizations that are also just a little more thoughtful about human beings. Um, overall, and that they're trying to figure out how do we match an individual and the talents that they have with the right task. That if somebody is particularly good at something, they have them doing what they're particularly good at. For example, if somebody's blind, they probably don't have them sorting uh, produce by color. Um, or sorting cans of goods by color if they're blind. They have them doing something else. You know, for example, if you um, lose your passport and you're about to leave the country and you urgently, urgently need to get a brand new passport and you're gonna have to call the State Department to figure out how do I get a rush passport so I can go on my trip, who are you gonna talk to? You're gonna speak with somebody blind who's living in um, in Minnesota because all the people doing the job of getting those passports are all people who are blind, who are working in Minnesota with a State Department contract who are extremely good at it. And they can help you get a passport in the same day. So part of it is just about making sure that people in an organization are doing the right task for the skills that they bring to the table. And that's a really important thing for all kinds of talent, where they, whether they have a disability or not. Thank you. Um, so 
do we have enough time for another question? I was like, I think we do. So um, says my org holds many walking home building hard hat tours, um, uh, tours to make sure our programs are accessible to everyone and wonder if we can offer alternatives for those who can't attend in body. We have thought of virtual tours, drone views, but none of us have a physical disability. So to your earlier point, no one who personally faces access challenges daily at the table, helping us to create smart and compassionate, anything we can do to encourage all to attend in some manner or way, all kinds of spaces. And I think it goes back to us saying, when you make those conscious efforts in your advertisement and pointing out that you are inclusive of people, and yes, having those things like a virtual chat where someone can participate if they maybe can't make it there in person or you know, use Zoom or things like that. I think that's very important. I didn't know if you guys had anything you wanted to add to that. So I'd like to add that um, people who are marginalized are sometimes expected to, to really bear emotional labor um, to answer everybody's questions for free. And some of these people don't have jobs. So I'm just gonna give myself as an example that I'm somebody of white and other privilege. And so I always want to really be good on racial justice issues and cultural competencies on Russia, racial justice issues is not something that I always know the right answer on. So rather than turning to one of my colleagues or one of my coworkers or friends or volunteers and asking them to again give emotional labor to ask them that for free, we actually hire um, an expert on um, racial justice and equity issues, who we have as a resource, and we pay that person to give us expertise. You can reach out to respectability and get free advice on a lot of things. Most of it is online. But if you have something like a building and you want to see if it's accessible, hire somebody who's a wheelchair user, pay them money to come through and give you advice. There are people, if you call your independent living center, they probably have an expert in this exact thing who can come right over and you can pay them for the day to come over and show you what works and what doesn't work. And you may not be thinking of, for example, somebody can get into the bathroom, they might be able to use the toilet. What are they gonna do to get to the sink to wash their hands? How are you gonna think about that? Um, is there a plan B for how they can do that? So there are a lot of different ways that you can do it, but I just encourage you not to expect every person with a disability to solve all your disability problems for free, that you should have a budget um, for the expertise and not expect marginalized people to give um, emotional and, and, and other labor and expertise always for free. Um, someone says, can you give more information on website and online materials being screened? So that, again, we have a full webinar, a yes. webinar yes. on that. Um, it is on social media accessibility and web accessibility. So you can check that out. Like we said, the link to this will be available. So you will be able to check out all those resources at your leisure. Um, someone said best practices for dealing with landlords and management that only do the bare, mi bare minimum in regards to accessibility. So what if it, the accessibility of where your building is is not in your control? Maybe Matan, you can answer this. Okay, so there, first of all, I think it's important to note there is a huge difference between the bare minimum and not doing what you're supposed to do. So I think one really important step in a question like that is determine what the bare minimum is because the bare minimum may actually be more than your landlord is doing. But let's assume that they have in fact done, to quote the question, the bare minimum, then how do we get anyone to exceed the minimum? We make them feel that to do so is in their best interest. So if I own a building, and because this is the nature of today's real estate market in a lot of cities, I have relatively consistent vacancy in my building, and I want to fill my building, you point out that there are any number of organizations that will not rent from them unless they really are leading on access, for instance, that they'll have an easier time filling their building if they make it accessible. My rule of thumb is always try to see how we can make a person feel that this is in their own best interest. And again, one, a slide we don't have in here, but data that respectability often shares, the disability market represents, what's the number, Jennifer? I just, 
is it, I'm going to get it wrong. Is it a hundred billion? Uh, it's a trillion dollar, dollar market. The it's a trillion market, dollar market. It's literally so, a trillion dollar market. So because so, we're one out of every four adults, and because the majority of people have a loved one with a disability, this is a massive, massive market. And so you can use um, positive encouragement to try and get people to be, um, you know, much more accessible. Yeah, let them know what they're missing. Yeah. Yes. Um, so let me see, go to another one. Are we good on time? Uh, so I see a lot of people asking um, additional resources for working with people specifically cognitive and neurological disabilities or mental health disorders. Do you guys have any suggestions on that? So I'll just say that um, our organization has a lot of people with autism and um, or other kinds of disabilities that might make it more challenging for them socially. And one of the things that we do is we bring in a lot of guest speakers and we do those guest speakers over lunch. But even on days when we don't have guest speakers, we literally have lunch as a staff together, all of our staff and all of our fellows, which are essentially um, interns who are being trained to go into the nonprofit space, public policy or communications. We all eat lunch together always. So it's people who are deaf, people who are blind, people who use wheelchairs, people who have autism, that we all are sitting together having lunch together every day and everybody is kind to one another and people get much more comfortable um, with the social interaction. The other thing we do is when we have guest speakers, um, we have a member of our team introduce that guest speaker, even though they're introducing the speaker in front of just our own staff and our own team. Um, it helps people with the ability to do public speaking and get over shyness and that sort of thing. So a couple of things to do is just to make those steps sort of smaller steps that people can accomplish, number one. Um, and number two, food. I mean, really food goes a long way to make people feel more comfortable if your organization can't afford to do lunch on a regular basis, and I will say that that's actually pretty expensive, that you can still bring in donuts in the morning and have coffee, you know, one day a week and have like a coffee time or, or have a break time where, you know, be sure to celebrate everybody's birthdays and those sorts of things. Those sorts of warm touches um, really do seem to make a difference. Um, there have been a lot of questions about recruitments of people to be on boards and staff. I would just say that one of the beautiful things that I've seen was a different disability organization other than ours, which is the ARC. So the ARC is a really, really old, well-established, very large disability organization that is largely white two-parent families of relative privilege of people largely with intellectual disability. So they now wanna have more people with disabilities on their board. They wanna have more people of color on their teams and a lot more diversity overall. So they literally put out an RFP, a request for proposal type of thing, inviting people to nominate themselves to be board members. And then they give, um, then they interview those people, they tell them about the organization, they give her, them smaller volunteer opportunities so they get to sort of get to know each other better. But they really put out the word systematically to everyone that we're a place that wants to serve the community. And if you are a person with a disability or you're a person of color and you wanna be a person in leadership in our organization, we're very, very open to that and instant interested in that. And I think that that is a, a really fantastic, um, a fantastic practice. I've seen a lot of improvement in the ARC. I think that their um, CEO, Robert Burns, is doing a great job in advancing um, equity through their organization by being very intentional. And I think that all the disability space and all the non-disability space of uh, philanthropy and nonprofits can learn from people who are very intentional about making sure that the people they serve or want to serve are represented in their own leadership. I see a lot of questions about funding for accessibility. Um, so is, would any of you like to address that? Matan? Um, so I think that part of the key to, to funding this in a really appropriate way is actually strange though it may seem, you don't seek funding for accessibility. What you do is when you're seeking funding 
for your programs, you make accessibility an integral part of the program. Because just as we have said to every nonprofit here on the call today, that disability is a part of your mission? Well, the answer really is to say, not who is a funder that funds access, because very few funders actually sit down and say, this is the funding area that I want. You say, if you care about serving people of color, say, then you care about serving people of color that have access needs. If you care about meeting educational needs, then you care about meeting the educational needs of people that have access needs. So I would say the key is actually, you build right into your programmatic grant proposals that you want to serve, um, that you want to serve folks with disabilities as part of your programs, that you have access costs to get that done, and that as a part of your grant proposal for your larger program, here is the access cost, because I actually think there will not be, but I do want to take an opportunity, because it's something I did see in the question box going forward, to point out that while there are costs associated with access, sometimes a lot of accommodations are free, a lot of accommodations are a lot cheaper than people's perception of those costs. So I would say before you start worrying about where the dollars are coming from, get a sense of what your price tag really is. Before I joined Respectability, I actually spent six years working with nonprofits to figure these things out, and every time they would get the budgets back and they'd be shocked by how much less it cost to do what it was they wanted to do than what they thought it was good. So before you spend a lot of time pondering the cost, figure out what you want to do, what it's going to cost, and then as I said, build it right into that programmatic proposal. So, so you know, I think that's part of the guidance that I would give. I see a couple of different questions in regards to um, nonprofits that do a lot of outdoor activities. And to get people with disabilities to get involved, one of the things I would say is whatever outdoor activities you guys are participating in, find another organization that has adaptive sports that are doing that activity. I promise you, any sport or, act or outdoor activity that you are doing, there is an organization out there that has an adaptive version of that. Um, so collaborate with them and see what they're doing. Maybe join with them on an event or something like that. That would definitely be my suggestion and sought them out so that you can see that people with disabilities can do adaptive sports and outdoor activities just as much as people without disabilities. Um, Okay, another one says, we are having such a difficult time finding quality people with disabilities that are committed. Any tips on how to vet good candidates for my board? Well, I think you have to know what it is that you want your board members to do. So if, for example, you need somebody who's an attorney or who's good at finance, it really helps if you can outline what it is that you need your board members to do so that you're aligning the people that you're recruiting with an actual need. Um, people are busy and people want to make a difference. They don't want to sit on a, a board where they're just the amen choir saying, hey, great to rubber stamp, you know, everything that's happening in the organization. They want to be contributing. So I think that the first thing you have to do is take an inventory of what do you want board members to accomplish? What, what kinds of expertise do you want them to have? In our organization, um, we have um, a challenge. So we want to be majority disability. Okay, so that's a goal. But we also want to be sure that we're raising enough money to keep our doors open. And, you know, look, I mean, the fact is that people with disabilities frequently don't have very much money at all. In fact, only one in out of every three adults with a disability even has a job. So we're disproportionately a community that lives in extreme poverty. So how do you raise money? in an organization and how do you have sort of a give get minimum? So our organization created a solution. I don't know if it's the best solution, but it's what we do, which is that we have a board of directors and a board of advisors. And essentially the difference is that the board of directors is supposed to write a big check or solicit big checks. And the board of advisors are people who are there because they're offering a very specific kind of expertise. Maybe they have a certain kind of disability and they're um, very, very expert in disability employment, for example. Whatever it is, they have expertise in that. But the thing is that our two boards meet together as one. 
So it's not that there's a hierarchy that people on the board of directors, uh, because they write checks, is more valuable than the people who are giving us advice. They have the same, uh, they meet as one, they vote, they have equal votes, they have an equal process, but enables us to have both kinds of people. But the key is that you have to understand what you want people to accomplish and then to find people who can accomplish those things. And then you have to give those people um, you know, the work to do it. And then you have to trust them um, to give them a little leash so that they can go out and do it. I, I personally, as a CEO of a nonprofit organization, still find this to be pretty difficult. We have a large board between our boards of directors and advisors, and not everyone is as busy doing stuff to help us as I would like, but overall, our board members are, you know, just incredibly talented and devoted to our mission. Um, but we also don't put people on our board unless, you know, by and large, they've been involved with us for some period of time and they sort of know the drill. Um, and again, that we know why it is that they're, we're recruiting them to be on our board. What, what role are they there to play? So I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, then feel free to jot some more notes and I can try more. Tatiana or Matan, did you want to add on to that? No, I, I no. think that you've hit the nail on the head. I, I think that I also referenced Jeff, Jennifer's earlier answers about reaching out to your membership and the people that you already serve, encouraging self-nomination from uh, the folks that you want and also just some intentionality in your community. You know, if you identify, and I know because I'm often on the receiving end of pitches like this, if you identify a prominent disability leader in your community and you feel like they might have something to offer your organization, well, give them a call. They may, they may say no. I often turn down such calls, but they will probably be flattered to get the call. And if they're passionate about your mission, then like every other board member uh, that joined because they were passionate about your mission, they may say yes. You know, I mean, I don't know how all organizations do it, but on every board I've ever served, we sort of have an informal wish list, right? We have people in our community that we know would be great for our board if only we could get them. Well, build yourself a disability wish list. You know, you live somewhere, you operate somewhere, there are people with disabilities in your community, some of them will be prominent, you know, see, seek them out just like you would seek out someone who's a prominent donor or someone who's a prominent subject matter expert, you know, put that sort of thoughtful approach into it. Um, and I will say Google and social media will be your friend on that. You can literally go to social media and look up the hashtag disability or disability rights or different disability related hashtags, you can find prominent people um, with disabilities in your area, more than likely they're on social media and you'll be able to access them. That is a great way to find us. <laughs> and um, I'll go so to the next one. one. question. Oh, go ahead. Remaining in our box. And I thought, you know, go as ahead. the resident lawyer on the call, I, I'd jump in on this question directly. And I would say, we don't necessarily address this directly, but there are excellent resources available from the federal government itself explaining how to navigate appropriately, um, you know, all of the wonderful work incentive programs that exist uh, within uh, SSI and SSD. I would recommend, you know, that if you're in California, for instance, the state of California has a DB 101 website that does a lot to uh, answer some of those questions. There really are resources out there if that's your particular question. The one general answer that I will give is that especially for, uh, you know, for things that are on the startup sort of low revenue slash uh, volunteer side of things, it's actually much easier than you think not to lose those benefits there programs and incentives and match programs and all kinds of things that, that we don't officially counsel people on, but, uh, but that, you can, that you can go out and find. Um, so so I, see a, I would recommend. 
a really great Do question. That. He says, can you talk about uh, recommendations, limitations of when and how we might act to self-identify as a person with a disability when recruiting, volunteering, or even employees? As a speaker is saying, okay. So basically they wanna know as far as people self-identifying and hiring. And then someone said a similar question of as asking accommodations and they, they have dyslexia. So asking so, accommodations. So I figured you can answer that from a legal standpoint. So again, standpoint. maybe I'll, I'll jump into the, the self-identification question. So first of all, just reminding in general, we can't make our uh, employment decisions, um, you know, by judging based on people with disabilities, meaning you don't want to ask the question as part of a job application. And if there's any implication that it might impact whether someone gets the job, I would recommend starting with the language used by um, used by the federal government and federal contractors who are required to recruit people with disabilities. And that language basically says we are required to, you know, have a federal program of uh, having folks with disabilities. Therefore, we would be grateful if you choose to voluntarily self-identify that you meet that uh, requirement. So that is one way to do it. And variations on that theme where basically you say, you know, look, we, you know, have as a positive value identifying who's out there. If you want to help us by sharing that information, we'd be grateful. You know, makes it clear that you're not making decisions based on it. It opens the door uh, for folks to share. Now, the question of when do you self-disclose? Well, I mean, that's, it's hard, right? Because on the one hand, we know that bias and stigma are out there. So we know that the moment you self disclose two things have happened. On the one hand, you have activated all the legal protections for someone who is doing a good job at their job, who is self-disclosing a disability and asking for an accommodation, and they're there, and they're important, and you can't get them if you don't disclose that you have a disability, because that is sort of the basic qualifying threshold. On the other hand, you do open yourself up to uh, questions of people's biases and stigmas. So I want to answer the question in two parts. I want to say that for the person, you know, think very carefully about to whom you disclose and how you feel about disclosing. But I want to answer this question. This is a webinar for organizations. And I want to think about how organizations can solve this problem. And the way that organizations can solve this problem is very simple. You want all of your employees, all of your volunteers, everyone that works with you to be as productive as possible. So what if instead of requiring someone to identify that they have a particular disability and why when they ask for something that's going to make them more productive, you simply have a Blake and statement available that says you can always ask your manager for something that's going to make you more productive and we'll discuss whether it's the cost effective right decision for the organization to do it. You don't actually have to provide that justification text unless we get to a point of disagreement where the law comes in. I always like to say that I'm a lawyer that hates legal processes, so I'm a lawyer that thinks that if we can keep everything in terms of positive productivity and only jump to the legal side of things when there's like a real place of disagreement, everyone is better off. Don't know if I articulated that as clearly as I could, but uh, Jennifer, if you have anything to jump in and add. Well, I just um, want to say that I see a question about the tips for avoiding perceptions of tokenization. I realize this is a wider, more challenging question of DNI in general. Thanks uh, for your time and resources. That um, one of the things that some studies I've seen about hiring people of color, for example, is that let's say you have an organization with 50 employees, and wow, none of them are people of color. Um, you might want to wait until you have multiple job openings and hire multiple people of color at the same time so they're not the only one. Um, larger organizations like the Fortune 500 companies, they all have something called ERGS, employee resource groups. So a large corporation, a Fortune 500 company will have an LGBTQ ERG, they'll have a women, might have a women's ERG, they'll definitely have African American or a Latinx ERG, and they should also have one 
for people with disabilities and their family members. And, and I do think that it's important to have these resource groups be for allies too, because let's say somebody has a non-visible disability, like mental health or dyslexia, for example, they might not wanna show up at the disability employee resource group meeting if all of a sudden it's thought that only people with disabilities should be coming to that. Let it be people with disabilities and their allies so that people who don't want to publicly self-disclose can feel comfortable going and that siblings or parents of people with disabilities can feel comfortable um, going. I think that is very important. Um, you know, and, and also it's important to understand that when somebody self-discloses that they have a disability, they don't have a meeting with 100% of the staff and say, hey, everyone, I'm living with schizophrenia and I just wanted you all to know that um, on Wednesdays I need to leave early to go see my doctor so I can stay on my meds. That is just not how it happens. What happens is somebody goes to their hiring manager in HR, where it is a confidential discussion, where they do not have to say, I have schizophrenia and that's why I'm leaving early. They say, I have a disability and want to let you know, so it's documented that I have a disability. And I'd like to talk to you about flex time because every Wednesday I have a medical thing that I need to do. So I'd like to work out um, which days and hours you'd like me to work extra so that I can make up those extra two hours because I'm leaving early on Wednesday. And that HR manager gives you the accommodations that you need so that you can thrive in the workplace and doesn't talk about it to anybody else. It is kind of like Las Vegas, that what you know happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens between you and the HR manager that's working out the accommodations is confidential and must be protected as being com confidential. It is not you know, what we discuss around uh, the lunch table. It is a piece of confidential information and must be um, done in a confidential um, sort of way. I know that we're um, coming up with only three minutes left. I just wanna say, we were really blown away by the number of wonderful people who signed up for this webinar. When we looked at the organizations from all over the country, by the way, more than 650 people signed up for this webinar, which means that whether you're on live or you're gonna be listening later um, because it's being recorded, that is one heck of a lot of the nonprofit sector, the philanthropy sector to have 650 leaders, people who care, thought leaders, people who are doing wonderful things Things, whether it's on homelessness, climate change, education, the arts, racial justice, so many different issues. Um, it is just a real, real honor for my colleagues, Matan and Tatiana and myself to join with Elizabeth from Candid, such an extremely fabulous organization, um, to spend a little time with you this afternoon to talk about these issues. But you are gonna have links on that website. We have a lot of um, webinars that are very specific on things like how can you put the captions on your um, videos, which is very quick and very easy. And again, it's free. How do you um, do an event checklist so that Matan and Tatiana, who are wheelchair users, can go to your event? Um, all of those things are available for free and you can do it. You can do it and your organizations, no matter what the issue is, will be stronger and better because you are welcoming and inclusive to people who either always had a disability or to people who may have been your most important donor, your most important volunteer, and now they're in a car accident or now they develop a hearing loss. Um, you wanna keep them engaged. No matter what the disability issue is, your organization is gonna be more powerful, more successful, more impactful if you include the one in four adults who have a disability. If you recognize that one in five people in this country has one and that the majority of school children with disabilities also have a compounded issue that they're also children of color frequently in under-resourced schools. And so you need to think about those issues of intersectionality. So I just wanna thank uh, my colleagues, Matan and Tatiana for being with me on this, on this webinar. I really wanna thank Candid and Elizabeth 
for hosting us. I want to turn it over um, to Elizabeth to see if there's anything she wants to add um, from Candid. Um, but we're just um, thrilled to have this, uh, have this opportunity to speak with you here today. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, and for everyone here who's really interested in getting more resources on disability, please go to Respectability's websites. Uh, they are much more experts than we are here at Candid, which is why we partnered with them for this offering. Uh, that being said, we do have our diversity, equity, and inclusion webinar series that we have been doing. One of the courses that you can take is self-paced, and that's, you know, if you're just getting started, diversity and inclusion, walking the talk. And then the next webinar that we'll have in this series is actually actually incorporating that Lequity lens into your hiring practices, and that will be on April 9th. Again, all of this information will be included in the follow-up email. With that, I just want to say thank you to the three of you for your time, um, for putting all of this together. This has been such a great webinar with tons of information. For everyone who's still on the line, rest assured that you will receive a follow-up email with that transcript, a link to view the recording, and the PowerPoint. Uh, within the next week or so, we want to make sure that that transcript is up to date with everything that was covered today. On behalf of our team here at Candid and Respectability, we definitely invite you to continue connecting with us on social media, and we hope that you join us again soon for another webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much.